Good morning to everyone. Certainly hope all of you are having a good day already. If you'll join with me in our call to worship. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I do want to welcome all of you who um, are here today. We thank you for your presence. For those of you who are visitors, we thank you also for your presence. Um, and uh, as well, we want to continue to greet those who do watch the video of the service a little later in the week. Um, I'm going to continue to uh, ask you to take time to find the friendship pad in the pew and uh, sign your name. Um, I do want to ask this one thing. Uh, for those of you who may be visitors, if you would like to hear more about the church or if you would actually like to join the church next Sunday after church, um, I'm going to uh, be ready to meet with anybody who wants to do that in the fellowship hall uh, going to ask you to go get some lunch and then carry it over and then meet with us, meet with me. It will not be very long. Uh, we will have some elders there, so if you actually want to join the church on Sunday, you can do it by reaffirmation of faith or by transfer of letter. So uh, for those of you who are interested, um, I, I would like to have a chance to visit with you. promise it will not be very long. Uh, you will take note, today is uh, Memorial Day, or we're, well, we're going to be we're, Memorial Day is next week. Uh, this is the uh, time when we recognize those of, uh, of of the community or related to the community who have graduated. So I hope that you'll take time to, to to review that. Remember that the bulletin now is our mission, our our newsletter. So we encourage you to read it. I apologize. I'm guessing the printer has had a bad day this week, so it's a little bit on the gray side. Uh, so, um, with that in mind, let us continue our worship. sentences. We may not know the time or the place, but we know that God is restoring the world. We may not see the risen Christ before us, but we know his spirit rests on us. We may not know what God is doing next, but we come together in faith excited to discover it. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our God, we give you thanks for the new life that you raise up in us through the mystery of our baptism, the sorrow of the heavy cross, the surprise of the empty tomb, the love that death could not destroy. By the power of your Holy Spirit poured out upon us in baptism, fill us now with the joy of resurrection so that we may be a living sign of your new heaven and new earth through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. We stand together and sing the hymn, Alleluia, Sing to Jesus, hymn number 260, verses 1 and 2.
Please be seated. Scripture tells us that our sufferings are known to Christ, that we can cast all our anxiety on Jesus, who restores, supports, strengthens, and establishes us. Knowing this, let us come to God in a spirit of openness. Please join me now in our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Christ our Savior, as you ascended, you left the work to us. You called us to keep the movement going, to witness to the ends of the earth, to pray, to heal, to glorify you through our thoughts, words, and deeds, to show the world a glimpse of the goodness you have given us. We have fallen short of this call. We have hidden ourselves in fear, sought our own comfort, and resigned ourselves to the status quo. Forgive us and strengthen us to do your will that we may be signs of your coming reign. And now let us go to God in silent confession. Let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen to this prayer. This is the prayer that Christ prayed on our behalf. Protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. This tenderness and care for us shows us who Jesus is, the one who hears our prayers, responding to our longing for forgiveness with mercy. Thanks be to God. Praise be to Christ. Glory be to the Holy Spirit. Since God loves us so much, we too should love each other. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And let us share that peace amongst ourselves, saying the peace of Christ be with you. For the last few Sundays, we've been talking about the sightings of Jesus so that we know for a fact that he rose from the dead. It's time for Jesus to leave the disciples. He's been with them for over a month, and he draws them together, and he says, we need to say goodbye. And, of course, there were lots of tears, and Jesus said, but you know, I've taught you all that you need to know. And they kind of rehearsed all of the things he had told them, he says, you are going to be okay because I'm going to send my spirit back to be with you so that you can do all the things that you need to do. And then he left them with one last miracle. He asked his disciples to follow him one more time and he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting his hands... He blessed them, and while he was blessing them, 
He withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they saw this. They worshipped him. They returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They knew that the Spirit of the Lord was with them. Just as the Spirit of the Lord is with us. So if all of you will follow along with me, with the children, repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I don't have to look for you. I don't have to look for you. I see you in my friends. I see you in my friends. I see you in my family. I see you in my family. You are here today. You are here today and always and always. Amen. Now the children are going to leave to um, do godly play with Miss Melissa, but they will be back too because this is a Change for Change Sunday and our children will be collecting the offering, as you know. So let it be as noisy, as change-filled as possible. For those of you who may be new, Change for Change is our special offering where we use monies uh, collected for food scarcity in our area. Uh, you may notice uh, as you walk out in a little bit our uh, little food pantry that goes next to the uh, little library. Um, and I hope if you're interested and feel so led that you might be willing to support that. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we lift up a deep, heartfelt conviction for the healing of the church in America and even for the healing of the church worldwide. We are mindful of the way that the church is being corrupted in many and varied ways. We're also mindful that many, many people are not finding what we do through our witness attractive enough to come and join alongside us to do beautiful things for God. Nevertheless, we do know and celebrate those who remain very dedicated to to Jesus, but also to the Church of Jesus Christ. And we're grateful for the opportunities that avail to us to do beautiful things for God and for others. Uh, as we think about your scripture today, we'd ask that you open up your mind, our minds and our hearts and bend our wills in a direction that you so desire. So hear our prayer. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our first text is just a reminder that the worldwide church is uh, recognizing the ascension of Jesus. This is after Jesus was resurrected. Uh, there's one or two narratives of his ascension. We don't talk about that very much, but I do want to remind us of that part of the narrative of the Jesus story. So it's Acts chapter six verses, Acts chapter one verses six through eleven. So here are these words. So when they had come together, they asked him, uh, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? And he replied, it is not for you to know the time or periods that the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Uh, this, is a mis this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our second lesson is taken from 1 Peter. It's a little bit of a difficult text, so let me set up something. Uh, This whole letter is written to uh, Gentiles in Rome who uh, walked with the followers of Jesus, who became Christians, essentially. And uh, they paid a price in the big cities for following Jesus because... um, one of the things they had to do is turn away from their families in many instances, and their families were not happy about it. But also, they had to struggle with a certain kind of value system they had been reared in in greco Roman Roman culture, and it had to shift into something a good bit different in order to take up the cross and walk with Jesus Christ. And so this, and, and then there was the third factor of actual persecution. Uh, both for Jews and followers of Jesus uh, for a number of centuries. And that's the backdrop of this text. Um, the verses I'm going to read are First Peter uh, chapter 4, verses 12 through 14, and then First uh, Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. So hear God's word. A beloved, speaking to a congregation, do not be surprised at the fiery, ordeal that is taking place among you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting uh, on you. And then these words, an admonition. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves, keep alert, Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour you. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory of Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was at Duke, I had a professor named Stanley Horowitz who was a huge influence on me. Um, There were two take-home points that I wanted to accentuate from Dr. Horowitz. One was we wrote a little book that he had written called Treasures in Earthen Vessels. And... uh, it was very helpful because he used that as a metaphor. That's a Pauline metaphor. He used that as a metaphor to describe um, the complexity of what it means to be a congregation. And his point is, borrowing from that phrase, that there is a treasure in all of us as a community of faith. Uh, the earth and vessel part is the thing. There were, the earth and vessel part for Paul meant... Doing church is messy. Raise your hand if you've ever been frustrated by anything that's happened in a church. Right. One of the biggest decisions in life is what to decide about the fact that the church will always be human and therefore always will contain within it conflict and frustration sometimes misbehavior. It's an earthen vessel. And the frustrations can get so high that you may just want to wash your hands. But as I say, if you get tired of the hypocrites here, you can go meet some new ones somewhere else. There is no perfect church whatsoever. That was one of the lessons that really resonated with me from Dr. Harawas. The second is, he described the church as a community of character formation, Uh, uh, more specifically, a community 
of moral formation. One of our tasks as we live together is to develop into a highly moral community and a highly and have highly moral people. Now by character formation, let me point out a few uh, ways to get at that. One, choirs. Um, Richard and I have been doing church a long time and choirs often are one of the best formed communities in the church. You'll see sometimes multi-generations in the church. Um, You will see them putting their gifts to use beyond themselves for the sake of the people and for the glory of God. They're doing beautiful things for God through their music. Uh, Their their character formation uh, is when uh, Glenn, who has self-described him sometimes as a little dictator, uh, because he has to pull the best out of the choir, even as the choir has to deal with the limits of what they can do, right? Um, but it's all for the glory of God, and we all benefit from what they do. Amen? Amen. A second um, character formation goes to uh, the fact Mary Helen and I have been coaching sports for a long time and uh, coaching young children into developing to be little athletes, but more importantly, to be a community. Uh, Hopefully a a good athletic team, but really a community of character where you talk about, um, you know, how to be teammates and, uh, and how to work together to accomplish a higher goal and, and to encourage each other and more importantly often to help each other know how to uh, stay hopeful if you just got blasted like 80 to 2 as one of my basketball teams has been defeated by before. The third community is family. Howard Wass, and I agree with him, said this, that uh, it references something my mother always said, the religion that goes deepest and lasts longest is in the home. And Howard Wass would agree that the home is a laboratory. It's a laboratory of moral formation. It's in the home that we all learn how to behave. It's in the home that we all learn how to respect authority. It's in the home that our our parents and our grandparents and our extended family uh, teach you some of the lifelong values that have been passed down through the history. It's a, a, a community of forgiveness and it's a community of kindness. All of it's worked out in the home, which then leads to the church. The church is an augment to what happens in the home. It is, we are, therefore, a community of character. And our character is formed in the messiness of the earthiness of the church, where Christ does stuff in spite of us to do beautiful things for God. A lot of people are walking away from churches these days. They don't see the point of it. Well, you know, if you're infrequent, and you ever really participate in anything but come to worship, you're never really going to have access to the full gifts of the church in terms of formation. You have the, the worship services. You have the invitations to service beyond yourself, as we will do in a minute. You have the opportunity for extended fellowship. You have the ability to be in a truly intergenerational uh, community. Uh, you're asked to have certain kinds of values of which uh, the biggest one is we seek to be a community of love. All of it's tested and refined in the messiness of life. But if you stay in a church all of your life, you're going to be formed in a certain way. And the function of the church is to be a community of moral character that reveals through our efforts and our hopes and aspirations, what it means to embody the living Christ. Now, question. How many of you have ever lost your car keys? And maybe a few inappropriate words along the way. Yeah. You discover who you are as an individual 
and you discover who you are as a family, you discover who you are as a team, choir, discover who you are as a congregation when you're put under stress. And this letter that's being written here uh, is a, a demonstration of Peter trying to encourage the team, the little church, whoever it was that he was writing to, uh, to deeply commit themselves afresh to their moral values as they're under stress. It was Bishop Butler who wrote in the 17th century that resistance is the athletic side of life. It's resistance sometimes, let me guess, if you decide not to say something in case you want to say something because something in the church doesn't suit you. Anybody ever done that? You just zipped it because you knew it would have just made things a little bit worse. Resistance is um, when a church has to make a big transition. The transition I had when I was in Greensboro was to help it move from a suburban church to a city church. And that means two different classes of people, well-to-do people and forming families that were not so well-to-do, and that did not go well. But the church had to struggle with that to figure out who they wanted to be in a new reality. This church was full of people who were under extreme stress. And the, the take home then is um, who you're gonna be when you're under fire. I'm guessing there are people here who've had to figure that out for themselves where they had to decide because something wasn't right in their life or some relationship wasn't right. What kind of person do I wanna be now that I'm being tested and I'm really uncertain about my well-being or about the well-being of my family. Perhaps, perhaps one of the most important choices in life is to choose to decide who you want to be or the church's life who we want to be when we are under extreme stress. Now Peter's solution is to ask the congregation to double down on what seems like these days really old fashioned ideas that have withstood the test of time for thousands of years. The church is under stress in the United States. It's being corrupted by people who are blending partisanship and uh, patriotism into a Christ who's Lord of all nations. And when that happens, the church gets sick. The church is under stress because lots and lots of young people are walking away from it. And a lot of us are confused why. But maybe there's not enough salt in our witness that makes it tasty enough for them to stay. It's confusing to me, it's confusing to you. But the grace note today is to kind of take to heart what Peter says to a congregation under stress. Finally, all of you have unity of spirit. One of the things that I love about being a Presbyterian, and this doesn't mean other churches don't honor this, but it's sort of built into the DNA, is that we're the people of the middle way which means we have had as kind of a, a statement about ourselves that we want unity even as we embrace diversity. Which means that we do not become tight-fisted, we do not circle the wagons, we remain open even sometimes when there's certain things that for us individually may be a little challenging. Being inclusive and welcoming all people is one of those places. This congregation does a very good job with seeking to live in unity in Christ with great diversity. Peter says when you're under stress, you need to double down on empathy and sympathy on kindness and mercy. You need to uh, we need to be, when people come in, 
that they feel like we're sympathetic to who they are and what their needs are. Richard said to me often, the deacon ministry here is something else that we know from working in other churches that the work of Helen and others to create the deacon ministry here is one of the strengths of the church. This congregation is gifted at sympathy. Peter says, if you're under stress, maintain a tender heart. Tenderness, not bitterness. Tenderness, not grouchy. Tenderness, not partisan. Tenderness, not hateful. Tenderness, but hopeful. Tenderness with mercy. Tenderness with generosity. Tenderness with any other kind of virtue that you can name. One of the great things about virtues is they build on each other. Loving justice. Merciful kindness. Hopeful character. One of the things with partisanship is it just gets more and more diverse. There's no such thing as hateful love. But we're called to demonstrate with each other as a community a, a tender heart. Peter says, as a, as a community, as a community, have a humble mind. Humble hummus from the dirt, be earthy. Remind ourselves that we are all planted in the same soil. One of the great things that I love about being Presbyterian is this whole idea that we serve God best and well by using our minds well. We are, through long history, thinking communities, which allows us the freedom to be sort of humble about what we know and more importantly about what we don't know. I, con I continue to say, quoting John Calvin, Presbyterians remain steadfastly committed to having a teachable mind. The point of all of this is that under stress, what Peter says to us, whether you're an individual a family, a team, a choir, or, or anything else, is that you double down on the virtues of life, the good ethics of life. And you may be under test for a long time, but you stick to it. The great part about a community of faith is we can work together, even if individually we might struggle, to do this kind of moral character formation work. Now, I need to close. Um, there's one text here that he has. <clears throat> like a roaring lion, your adversary the devil prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. We don't typically use the word devil anymore, but we're dumb if we don't. Talking about really what a real devil is, I'm not going to do. But the demonic spirit work is always present. Demonic work is principalities and powers. Demonic work is when uh, people are feeding us a pile of garbage. Demonic work is when we begin to embrace that kind of guard. We are living in an age of disinformation. It's hard to know the truth. And so we, he says, need to resist that and find other sources of truth. And in a church, Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life. If you go that way, if you seek his truth, good things always happen. So the key point for the day is for you to keep in mind uh, how do you perform under stress? The grace note from Peter is always, always 
turn to your values. I'll close with this. I learned from my brother-in-law a great way to do uh, marriage counseling of, say, marriages that have been around, I don't know, 25 years, and they're struggling. It's just a tool. It doesn't always work. But I think it was my brother-in-law. He said, I just had to go back to their original wedding vows and then sat in a conversation and asked them what they were committing to with each other during their wedding vows. And they went through the wedding vows. And sometimes we need to be reminded when we're under stress to go back to the deepest commitments that we've made in our life and reboot and restart and rededicate and get busy with living a holy life. Uh, Let us pray. Lord, we pray for the church all over the world. We thank you for the real beacons of light, churches that just are turned on by Jesus. And as a consequence, the fruits are just evident. Even as we pray that, we, we, we're mindful of a sort of corrosion in the American church in particular, where partisanship and politics have started to infect the, the teachings of Jesus and what it means to be Christian. Help us be on guard about that here, but help us have some wisdom to understand what exactly is going on. We pray for any individual here today who is under a fiery ordeal, who is in some sort of troubled relationship, who is confused, who haven't really dedicated to something beyond themselves, who pastorally is struggling with aspects of life like grief. Help them cleave to the great virtues of life. Help them rededicate their energies to going that way, towards the virtues and not devolve into the vices. And to the extent it is possible, may this congregation be one of those safe places where somebody can come and just be and borrow from the strength of others so that they can eventually grow themselves some new strength and to move on away from the heart parts into something beautiful and glorious, something exciting about life. You are our Lord, Jesus. Come be near us. We pray in your name. People say, amen. Our affirmation of faith comes from the Confession of 1967. Let us stand together now and say what we believe. New life in Christ takes shape in a community in which people know that God loves and accepts them in spite of what they are. They therefore accept themselves and love others, knowing that no one has any ground on which to stand except God's grace. And now we sing together at the name of Jesus, hymn number 264.
us join together now in the prayers of the people. Let us keep silence. Let us pray. We offer our prayers through Christ who lives and reigns forever and prays for us in heaven. Lord, in your mercy. Through Christ, we pray for the church. May we devote ourselves to prayer and praise the name of the risen and ascended Lord, calling on the transforming gifts of the Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, through Christ we pray for the earth. Through Christ we pray for the earth, rain down in the abundance to restore the earth, scatter all the enemies of life and wholeness, transform desolate places into healthy homes. Lord, in your mercy, through Christ we pray for all nations. All authority in heaven and on earth is yours. Establish your new realm of justice and peace so that all will know your goodness and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Through Christ, we pray for this community. Keep us in solidarity with those who suffer. Deliver those who are facing fiery ordeals. Help them to remain strong, resisting evil. Lord, in your mercy. Through Christ, we pray for loved ones. Show your loving care and deep compassion for those who are hurting or anxious and tested. Strengthen and support them. Restore their lives. Lord, in your mercy. God of all power and glory, receive these prayers and continue your mighty work among us. Through Jesus Christ, our living Lord, and let all the people say, Amen. Speak of formation, uh, these prayers that we're using, prayers of the people, are structured in a way on purpose. Uh, And it's a perfect formation device. And I want to encourage some of you uh, to take the prayers that we are offering on Sundays and use those as a tool You see the little three dots called an ellipsis. That's where you take a pencil and put it to paper. Or you just put it to paper in your head and you pray and learn how to broaden your your prayer content. One first lesson about prayers is prayers first shape you over time. Uh, These structured prayers help you broaden what you pray for. Move away from the gimme, gimme, gimme prayers. Um, The second is as, as we are dedicating these pillowcases, uh, I want to remind you of the words from Mother Teresa, do beautiful things for God. And these pillowcases, which have been designed to be used, it says gifts for the bridge over, family, over troubled waters. I believe that's part of family promise, wherever Pat Kester is, right? Correct? No. Nope. Nope. New one. There you go. Shelter for our, thank you for that, Diane. I forgot to ask you about that this morning. Um, but that's doing something, small things with great love. The other thing is to remind you of another Mother Teresa thing. This is formation. The gospel in ten fingers, even the least of these, all are beloved of God. You ought to be teaching that to your kids, to your grandkids, and your friends. The simple way of summering the gospel. All of this is in the service of our text for stewardship. It's 1 John 3, 6. I usually read a few more verses, but uh, 16 through 18. Uh, This is a memory text we ought to have. We know, love by this, that Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. 
How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love, not in word or in speech, but in truth and action. Let us receive our offering. Let us pray. Great God, to you we give our thanks. Your steadfast love endures forever. With gratitude we bring our gifts to you. Bless us and our gifts that our lives and our resources may be a source of healing and hope of joy and justice in our world. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our living Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. Our hymn, Jesus Shall Reign Wherever the Sun, hymn number 265. Remind you that we continue our worship service at Holy Grounds uh, just over in Fellowship Hall. Please be seated for the blessing and the post league. Depart now in the fellowship of God the Father, and as you go, remember by the grace of God you were born into this world. By the mercy of God you've been kept all the day long, even into this hour, and by the love of God fully revealed in the face of Jesus the Christ, you are being redeemed. Amen. And amen. Just as he has loved us. Amen. Amen. 